वरेण्यम वर्गो देवस्य धीमही धीयो न प्रचोदया तत्सवितो वरेण्यम वर्गो देवस्य धीमही धीयो न प्रचोदया तत्सवितो वरेण्यम वर्गो देवस्य धीमही धीयो न प्रचोदया Okay, Om Sairam, uh, dear devotees. I hope all of you are keeping well. Um, tonight's uh, session is uh, going to be focused around um, health and wellness. And uh, we will be looking at uh, very specific uh, topics relating to um, how we can best organize this uh, wellness for ourselves. All right, so in the, the arena of health and wellness, um, we have to become aware that much of what happens uh, in the medical um, experience is really just managing the symptoms of your disease process. Not much of it is around how to establish health and wellness. And if the um, corona, the COVID-19 pandemic has taught us anything, it is that the people who are not really well, in other words, they have comorbid disease or imbalances, they are the ones who get really sick and often die from this COVID infection. Even with this latest variant, uh, there are some awful effects that are happening from it. And so the need to understand and learn what to do to recapture your health and wellness is what we're going to focus on today. And um, there are seven skills that you need to eventually master, but uh, we will progress with it bit by bit. If it needs that we do some other sessions to capture it, we will deal with it. So we'll cover a very wide range of concepts, but I want to just share uh, the, the sort of basic concepts that will help you to already take some steps to shift your health. Now, many, many discourses that Swami has given throughout the 85 odd years that he was in human form uh, revolved around how to look after our health, you know, what to eat, the little lifestyle habits and so on. And much of that is uh, really very common sense uh, in retrospect, because all the research studies show that it is the preventive knowledge that will stand you in good stead as you go into the senior years of your life. So let's take a look at something that uh, you know many GPs in clinical practice face. Firstly, there's a high percentage of symptoms and signs uh, displayed by patients that are not diagnosable by doctors. Most times it's a kind of a, a guess as to what it is. And much of a doctor's training is in managing symptoms of disease. Rarely do we deal with the cause. And this is especially so of chronic diseases. And doctors have not been trained at an undergraduate level to help patients regain their health and wellness. So these are factors that you need to bear in mind that, um, and I'll explain to you how there's only a certain stage at which a diagnosis can be made. Uh, all right, so when we look at the stages of a disease process on this left-hand side is the 
band of wellness. This is where you are optimally well, robust, immunity is good, appetite is, is great, and uh, your elimination processes are all good and successful, and you have no disturbance after uh, eating a meal. No bloating, no belching, no acidity, etc. And your energy is uh, vital. So this is a kind of band that we want to be in, even in, in our senior years of life. But we now know that there are six stages in how a disease process evolves. And I'm going to explain to you how that happens. Um, initially, Ayurveda described the concept of the digestive fire. And it says that when the digestion is impaired, that is the beginning of the disease process. And what really happens, and we may be able to go into some detail with this, is that when you do not digest what you've eaten appropriately, there is a semi-digested residue that is left behind. And for all intents and purposes, the body regards this as a toxin. You can sometimes see this accumulating on your tongue as a white coating. That is a toxin in, in Ayurveda, it's called ama, which literally means toxin. So the first stage is always the accumulation of this toxin. And it usually is in the stomach or gastrointestinal uh, system. As this progresses, so it means that the lifestyle and the kind of food that has been eaten has created this, this toxin. And if those don't change, either out of ignorance or the, the tamasic guna or the rajasic guna is so dominant that you still go back and you eat the, exactly the same thing again after the symptoms have subsided, then it progresses after a few months, few weeks, it becomes aggravation. So now the symptoms are more pronounced and uh, you might take some relieving things like uh, some antacid or enos or something to try and relieve those uh, disturbing symptoms. If you still haven't changed the lifestyle and the diet, uh, then that toxin now crosses the gut barrier and it begins to migrate through the blood and it is now going to create another set of symptoms. So when the toxin is migrating, there's another set of symptoms uh, that are produced or signs. Each of these, in fact, have their own sets of signs and symptoms. Then the fourth stage is when the disease, when the toxin localizes. It will localize to where there is a weak tissue in the body. And usually that is either tissue that has been previously damaged or weakened genetically. And then the toxin now begins to have a focus and more symptoms, more dramatic symptoms. So this is about where you will present to your, your doctor. From stage one to three, you're probably trying to manage this on your own, you know, going to the chemist, getting this, getting that, uh, trying all the uh, recommended remedies that friends and family might share with you. But when you hit the localization stage, the symptoms are more persistent and more dramatic. And now you go to your doctor. Unfortunately, these signs and symptoms don't fit any diagnostic uh, pattern. In other words, we still can't identify it. We can do some tests, still don't know what's going on. And then we tell you to wait and let's uh, see what happens. And what really is happening is that when you weight in stage four, the disease process is progressive. It now comes to the stage where you manifest it. So all along this band here, you will get recurring symptoms and signs, feeling uncomfortable. You take sick days off. Uh, you can probably end up going to many different doctors, uh, each one giving a different opinion, and none of the drugs that are recommended will, will work. And the reason for that is that the, the drugs are designed to treat and suppress certain symptoms. They're not going to reverse the cause of your condition, which is really this toxin building up. So the disease, stage of disease manifestation 
now the disease has progressed to a point where we can label it. So this is where in medical school we are trained to diagnose stage five. You must already have the disease. And uh, this will, uh, well, nowadays, you know, with diagnostics and so on, we may be able to diagnose it at about here, you know, 4.8, 4.9, um, something like pre-diabetes can be diagnosed at that point. But the stage of manifestation means that we're now getting organ disruption. The toxin is now affecting the cells. It's affecting the flow of blood to the cells. It's affecting the elimination of waste material from the cells. And literally the cell is choking on its own toxic waste. Um, it's also unable to access critical nutrients, it's unable to eliminate metabolic waste. And so the disease becomes rapidly progressive. And this is where we enter the band where you can be hospitalized. Uh, if it's still, if we still haven't made the changes in uh, diet and in lifestyle, then the disease becomes progressive and we now start to have organ failure, organ disruption, and we have complications. At this point, it is in and out of hospital, it's critical procedures, surgical procedures, and so on, until you inexorably arrive at your death, right? So a disease doesn't suddenly just appear one day, it's in progress. And in 99.9% .9 of the time, this is a lifestyle and diet uh, issue, not knowing what to eat, when to eat, how to eat. Um, and the lifestyle will have to, will deal with all the, the little things that we do that we really are just engaging our senses and satisfying or gratifying the senses. Um, and we'll deal a bit of, of that when we come to the aspect relating to diet. All right, so this, Six stages of disease sets the scene for understanding how, even if you're at the stage five and at the stage of complication, there's much you can do to gradually reverse it back to the state of wellness. Certainly from stage four backward, uh, it is reversible. And a wellness doctor trained in how to understand this can quite easily give you recommendations as to what to do to make the shift happening. How long do you have to do it? Depends on how long you've had the condition. Do you have to do it for the rest of your life? Well, of course, if you go back to your old ways, the whole process starts again and very soon you're gonna be back at manifestation. So in Ayurveda, the reason why you in fact go down this path of the six stages of disease is the choices that you are making. And these are choices in dietary matters, choices in lifestyle matters, choices in your psychosocial interactions, uh, choices in environmental aspects that you may not be aware of, but you are um, engaging. And this mistake of the intellect is called pragya aparada. Literally, it means mistake of the intellect. And the mistake of the intellect comes from only two things, dominant rajasic tendencies, dominant tamasic tendencies. If you have a dominant sattvic tendency in the intellect, you won't make those choices. And this is why Swami constantly reminded us about how we must navigate to the sattvic uh, mode of living, because anything that is not sattvic is going to end up in this process here. At a physical level and a mental level, emotional level, you're going to see this happening. All right, so here's what happens at a, a cellular level. At a cell has a cell membrane. The cell membrane is made up of critical nutrients and this enables the cell to uh, draw in or transport nutrients into the cell. The nutrients are used for whatever metabolic process is needed and then it eliminates the waste material. So nutrients get in, the waste gets out. And one of the critical nutrients needed in that cell membrane is a thing called an essential fatty acid. It's in a product known as TRAE-NM. Give you some details as to where you can access this. This can revolutionize your health in a matter of like a day, two days, maybe even a week. Now what's happening in a, an unhealthy cell? Well, firstly, 
that cell membrane is no longer effective and functional. The further you go down the six stages of disease, the more toxic is the cell, the more unhealthy is the cell membrane. So firstly, nutrients can't get in and metabolic waste can't leave the cell, right? And all the processes involved, the digestive enzymes, the metabolic enzymes, hormones, and uh, metabolic toxins all start to go dysfunctional in an unhealthy cell. And this, uh, you know, remember you've got something like 100 trillion cells in your body. When this process starts, you will start to feel fatigue as your first symptom. And then whatever organ is involved, those symptoms start to show up over and over again. It can happen over uh, a few uh, years, sometimes decades. So the digestive fire, as it is sometimes called, are really your pancreatic enzymes. So these are the enzymes released from your pancreas into the stomach, and together with the hydrochloric acid in your stomach, it begins to digest and break down the food. So using this analogy of the fire, the fuel, the wood, is the food, and the strength of the fire is the strength of these pancreatic enzymes. And so keep that idea in mind because Many little behaviors that we adopt unknowingly impact on this digestive fire. Right, so one of those things is that when you drink water in large quantities at once, and if that water is perhaps iced, or any, any drink that is iced with your meal or before your meal, you literally reduce the digestive fire. It's like taking a bucket of water and throwing it over a fire. Right? And what ensues is this metabolic toxin that is building up. It shows up on your tongue. This is what it looks like. It can be thicker than that. Um, this still has some, but it's largely cleared out. Right. So that brings us then to the, the idea of how do we then engage this process of, of wellness? And we're going to keep it very simple because. Um, it needs to be something that you can do practically um, on a day-to-day -day basis. So the, I'll just quickly go through what the seven skills are. Uh, the first is competent nutrition. Right? You have to know that your body runs on nutrition, doesn't run on drugs. If you haven't got competent nutrition, in other words, uh, there are more than like 150 different nutrients that your body needs that will come from the food that you're eating. If your food is already processed, if it's uh, preserved, if it's old food, leftover food, you're not getting competent nutrition. In fact, uh, it turns out that the World Health Organization estimates that it may be that more than 95% of people in the world are undernourished, not malnourished like you would find in third world countries, but undernourished. You're eating two, three meals a day, still not getting the nutrition. So um, restoring your competent nutrition is a very big part of how you um, get your health back. We'll deal with that a little bit in, in more detail. Now, second aspect is how to balance your metabolism. A balanced metabolism will efficiently digest the food extract the nutrients and eliminate the waste products. And metabolism depends on enzymes, coenzymes, hormones, and a whole range of other um, critical minerals that are needed for these metabolic processes. But the simplest way to understand this is that when you start to gradually become toxic, this toxin is building up and the toxin may come from undigested material, but it also could come from foods that you're eating. For example, cheese is a very toxic food to the metabolism. Swami told us that at the first international youth conference. If you eat this, it'll make you tired. So I know many of you are vegetarians and what's your options? Well, just remember that too much of that will give you problems in terms of toxicity. Other toxic foods are leftover foods. So things that you've cooked, refrigerated, you're eating two days later, three days later, things like the filling in your samosas, in your pies, 
um, anything that's been cooked, refrigerated, cooked, frozen, will become leftover. Of course, anything in a can, in a bottle, or in a packet is already old food. So just remember that. And you know, buying foods that have already been pre-cooked, frozen, and they sell it to you as a quick meal, you just have to heat it up, dead food, right? So dead food becomes your big toxin that you have to be wary of. And so how to balance this metabolism, we're gonna talk a bit about that in more detail. I'll share with you some very specific ideas. Right, the third aspect is peace of mind. The mind plays a major role in how health is structured or disease is created. And stress is a big player. Um, an unsteady mind, a mind that is perpetually um, aggravated by worry, uh, anxiety, and all of those agitated kind of states of mind uh, will eventually create disease. In fact, when you are very stressed and anxious, one of the first effects is going to be on your digestive process. It just blunts the digestion and the toxin starts to form. Right, fourth aspect is sleep nutrition. Now, um, getting adequate sleep is a form of nutrition. If you are, are sleeping and not getting deep rest, then this becomes its own problem in the way it disrupts the hormone rhythms in your body, the way it disrupts the met metabolism, et cetera. And it creates a whole host of other um, metabolic clinical problems for you. So what then is sleep nutrition? Well, in a sleep cycle, there are four stages. Stage one is called sleep induction. St stage two is REM sleep. Stage three and four together are regarded as slow wave sleep. And it is in this stage that all the renewal processes are happening in your body. Uh, one of the major things that happens here is that your body begins to release growth hormone and its active component IGF-1, which is a, re a repair hormone. It begins to repair damaged tissue, resets the body. So it's a very critical thing. Turns out that when you are not getting adequate sleep, so in you in sleep deprivation, besides affecting your cognitive ability in the day, um, it can create other problems with, with the response to your cortisol, the stress hormone secretion. You'll start to pump out a lot more. It can affect your pancreas, which will trigger a diabetic state. It can affect your thyroid function. It can affect your weight. And also it creates uh, sleep apnea. So you can put on a lot of fat just by being sleep deprived. Right, so getting adequate sleep is gonna be the next big uh, factor in, in correcting your health and wellness. The fifth skill is appropriate exercise. So not everybody can do the same kind of exercise. A lot depends on your genetics or your body type. So very thin, uh, people, this is called the Vata body type, who have thin muscle mass, very little fat, uh, long bones, uh, they're quite skinny. They can't do uh, very aggressive aerobic exercise. They need to do subtler exercises like yoga, qigong, um, and maybe a, a small amount of aerobic exercise. But someone who's uh, more robust, very stocky, big muscle bulk, thick bones, they, they need to do more aerobic exercise. Um, and then there's an intermediate group, the Pitta body type. They need to do almost like a 50-50 kind of uh, proportion of the energy repleting exercise, things like the yoga, qigong, tai chi, etc. And the other 50% can be the aerobic exercise. Right, sixth component is how to look after your immune system. We know about this now in a really serious, dramatic way with the COVID pandemic. When you have immune competence and one of the things that creates this immune collapse is the toxin that builds up in your body. 
because your immune competence is really dependent on your nutrition. And we're gonna talk a little bit about what critical nutrients in fact enhance that and also how it's linked to the balanced metabolism. So if you're toxic, building up this uh, armor, this sticky substance in your system, one of the first impacts is a lowering of your immune competence. Now you can't defend against the, uh, viruses, bacteria, et cetera, so efficiently. And if you add to that comorbid disease like diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, polycystic ovarian syndrome, uh, gastrointestinal diseases like ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, all of them impact on the immune system, all right? So how do you stabilize that? How do you bring this up? Uh, we're gonna talk about uh, firstly, substances that are critical for, uh, for this process. And then we will be talking about rasayanas or adaptogens that were known in, in the Ayurvedic times, how they can help you to bring up your immunity. Right, and then the last area is the state of joy. Now, you'd never think that this is a health and wellness skill, you know, most times we think that, well, if you experience joy, then you must be happy and there must be a reason for it. But physiologically, it turns out that joy is a kind of a default state. It's how the human is supposed to be functioning anyway. And Swami, in many, many, many of his discourses, speaks about this concept of being happy, uh, being joyful. Uh, it's almost like the attainment. This is what defines whether you're having a successful life or not. How much of joy do you have in your life? And this joy is not dependent on a thing or a circumstances or an event. It is an innate quality that shows up in your inner experience, in your mind, in your emotions, etc. There's equanimity, not buffeted by gain and loss, all the ups and downs in life. So this is the seventh one, and this is a, quite a critical one, uh, to be investing time in and how to get it right. So I just wanna quickly show you another way of understanding the progression of the six stages of disease. So in this first band, this is where we have first uh, perfect health. So this is where you're born. Hopefully you have 100% health. And if you follow and you know the six, seven skills of health, or your mother or father assists you in the early stages, your lifeline will look something like this. You'll go right up to about, um, close on to about 85, sorry, 80, before you begin to experience the decline. And so there's the stages, accumulation, aggravation, migration, localization, manifestation, complications, right? And so a healthy individual can comfortably live to about 98 to 100 years, that orange band there. But what we're seeing happening now is that more and more people, by the time they get to about age 50 or 60, they're already in decline. The accumulation has started. In fact, uh, this blue band actually should actually be something like that. Um, and so you can see how rapidly it progresses toward uh, the later stages of the disease process. And, uh, you know, to get to like 85 is still good. But what in reality, what we're seeing is this red band, right? All the people who are on chronic uh, medication, et cetera, this is the red band. And it rapidly progresses from accumulation, aggravation, migration, localization, and they're already in the stage of disease manifestation. Sometimes even by age 40, they already there and they don't get to 60 years or 70 years. So your longevity is drastically curtailed when this disease process takes off. And then we have this black band here, which is where at a very young age, the toxic process builds up, uh, aggravation, migration, localization, manifestation, complications, right? And many of the infective conditions because the immune system is so compromised because of uh, psychosocial issues, behaviors, and so on. Something like HIV AIDS, this is the trail of the condition. Now overlay this with the COVID 
pandemic and you can see that you may have been there and suddenly because you've got comorbid disease, your band suddenly becomes the red band or even the black band, depending on how intense the, uh, the infection is for you and how the immunity is uh, challenged. Right, just another version of that. So at birth here, there's your age in decades going across that way. The green band is like a healthy person. Yellow band, uh, still got optimal health and vitality right up to about 60, and then it starts to decline more. Declining health in the red band starts even earlier. In the late 30s already, health is declining. And the black band, even by the time the person is 30, the disease process is like rapidly showing worsening health, progressive disabilities. This is where young people are developing um, heart disease, becoming diabetic early and so on. So this just gives us a, a kind of a ballpark picture of what's happening in your life. And most of this is related to the diet and the lifestyle and the stress. Those seven factors we spoke about they are the things that can prevent this drift to disease. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, competent nutrition now. Um, the first thing to understand here is that the kind of food that we have access to today um, is nutrient depleted largely. So you might think you're buying good organic vegetables, et cetera, from Woolworths or wherever you think the food is great. But in reality, the quantity and the quality of the nutrients in that is depleted well below the, the bare minimum that you're going to need. So you would need to eat like two trolley loads at a time to try and get to the kind of competent nutrition your body needs. And therefore, this brings up the whole question of how do we supplement this? Unfortunately, in today's world, unless you live on an organic farm somewhere or you're in Pondicherry or, you know, where you can get this kind of healthy food, for most countries around the world, the nutrition is suboptimal. You can really think you're eating very healthy food, but it won't show in your status of health. So this often means that we've got to basically pay attention to certain things. So firstly, avoid leftover foods. Avoid foods that have been processed already. They almost become toxins within a, an hour or so in your body. Try and avoid foods that have been cooked and frozen, and then you're going to reheat. So uh, most of you, I think, buy your samosas frozen. But what you need to be aware of is that the filling is cooked, who knows, two, three weeks, a month ago. You buy it, freeze it, you bring it out when your visitors come. And that is toxic food, right? So eat as fresh as you, you can. Try to avoid foods coming out of a can a packet, a bottle, all right? And then foods that have a lot of salt in it, like pickles, they tend to aggravate and create a worsening in high blood pressure. So try and minimize or avoid that. And Swami gave another reason for why we should be avoiding the pickles. Uh, that salty taste evokes envy and jealousy in the mind. All right. Now, we're not even talking about the dangers of eating meat. You need to just go back to the discourse Swami gave on that called food, head, and God. It's your body. You need to follow it. No one is going to police you to decide whether you're doing it or not. Yeah. So just remember, you eat the wrong thing, you're going to have to pay the price. Right? So choice is yours. The more refined the intellect is, the more sattvic the intellect, the better choices you're going to make. Right, so it falls back right into the, into the intellect uh, where these, the seed of the disease is being sown. So you need to become aware of that and uh, be able to 
tackle it as a strategy in your, your wellness. Right. How can you supplement this? So there is over the last 42 years, we've trialed and tested many different kinds of nutrients uh, to see what works, what doesn't work. Most of the nutrients that are available, your vitamins, minerals, trace elements, the proteins, etc. Most of these are synthetic or elemental. They don't absorb very easily. So it's called bioavailability. Um, so your BCAL-D and all of that kind of thing, your, your magnesium, um, slow mag, all of those are elemental. The body doesn't know how to absorb it. Most of it is in your stool unabsorbed. If you get 3% absorbed and it in your gut, in your blood, that's very lucky. But if you use organic whole food nutrients, then you are going to get about a 97% bioavailability. Now, the nutrient almost acts like a therapeutic repairing substance in your body. And uh, some of these nutrients are so concentrated that it's like one tablet is like, or two tablets is like eating uh, two trolley loads of fresh fruit, vegetables, um, and other, other critical nutrients. Okay, so I'm going to give you a, uh, a name. I'll probably put it in the chat box a little later where you can access this because this is available in South Africa and that's the brand that you need to be using. It's called Neolife. Uh, they've been around for 62 years now. They are kind of the market leaders in nutrition and you can get almost everything that you want. They'll give you that link uh, where you can access that. All right, so uh, just a couple of other additional things. Uh, if you overweight, obviously you need to lose that weight. That will be assisted by detoxification, which is what the balanced metabolism is about, about cutting out the excessive carbs, so refined carbs, your rice, bread, potatoes, rotis, pizza, pastas, all the cakes and biscuits and sweets, all of those. Uh, refined carbs and sugars is what's going to give you the obesity. That needs to be corrected. Then Swami has given us the directive that eating one meal a day is the healthiest. Two meals a day, we are going to get diseased. Three meals a day, definitely we're going to get diseased. Right? So you won't die if you miss one meal or two meals. So in, get into this habit of eating one meal a day. Today it's called intermittent fasting. Amazing uh, skill for diabetics. Uh, anyone needs help in how to do this, uh, come and see us. We'll show you how to get it right relative to your condition. All right, but competent nutrition is what's needed. So there is a concept called core nutrition. So for you to get all the amino acids or protein that your body needs to repair, you need to have all 22 amino acids in one meal. If you're getting some at lunch, some at supper, some at breakfast, that doesn't do the trick. It needs to be in one meal and then you'll start to see the difference. So the amino acid blend that is available through this Neolife company has the, all 22 amino acids in one meal. It's like a shake and you have it once a day. Then there are the, all the other <clears throat> critical nutrients, the vitamins, the minerals, the trace elements, the carotenoids, the omegas, etc. All of those have to also be in that organic form. And they have a formula called Pro Vitality that delivers all of that. So if you take the shake and the, the Pro Vitality, that combination is giving you the complete nutrition that your body will ever need. And even within about two weeks, three weeks, you can already see the difference in your overall health. Many, many a time, uh, what we thought were irreversible diseases, they start to reverse because the body knows what to do with this kind of nutrition. All right, let's go to balanced meta metabolism. So largely, this means if your metabolism is sluggish, it means that the toxins are building up and it needs to be eliminated. So first thing that you can do to help this process is first get a kind of an idea, am I toxic? How will you know that? One, you'll have a funny coating on your tongue, whitish coating. You may have a, a many uh, taste, different tastes, bitter taste, metallic taste in your mouth. Uh, you may have bad breath. 
you also have an erratic kind of appetite. Sometimes you're hungry, sometimes you're not. Um, you're getting bloating and burping and acid reflux. And of course, you will then feel fatigue and tiredness, uh, drowsiness, um, almost like you, you're ill, but not sick enough to be in bed, but just day by day, you're chugging along and you just don't feel right most of the time. Um, that's one of that. So to do you a favor, um, Rayton, if you can collect the email addresses of all of the people who are participating here, I will then, or maybe I can send it to you and you can flick it out to everyone. We have a, a book that we've written called How to Detox Your Body. And it's in an ebook format, so you can access the wisdom. Much of what we've spoken about is in that book, booklet. Uh, use that as a guide, and then from there we can guide you with it. So over the years where we've run uh, this kind of rebalancing of the metabolism, the detoxification processes, uh, we've had to develop a, a vegetable broth. So this is a blend of different vegetables. And we've turned it into kind of an instant broth, but it's still organic. And taken twice a day, 10 o'clock and 3 o'clock, which is the liver cycle. And this begins to loosen, soften, loosen, and eliminate the toxins through the major elimination organs, which is the gut, um, the kidneys, the urine, and of course, the sweat ducts. And so this can accelerate the detoxification for you, especially if you've got a lot of acidity great for diabetics, uh, people wanting to lose weight. So I'll send that uh, information link to Rate, and you can have a look at it and see how it can assist you. Third thing to do to assist your detoxification, start a very simple fasting process. Maybe fast for half a day, for three days, five days, seven days. Or if you can manage, do a fast for most of the day, just eat a very light meal at night uh, and do it for like about uh, seven days. Um, so that fasting allows the digestive fire to rekindle itself and the enzymes begin to strengthen. And you can do this once a month, choose two or three days, do that kind of a fast to help you along. If you're diabetic or overweight, uh, it's even more profound. So this intermittent fasting, uh, we have different time bands. You can fast for 13 hours, 15 hours, 18 hours, and so on. But that should be under clinical guidance. All right. Third, the fourth thing that you can do is strengthen the digestive fire. And this is done by using ginger tea. So one-eighth of a teaspoon of ginger powder. Robertson's is a good brand. And in a mug of hot water, sip it after a meal like you're drinking a tea, at least three times a day. Ginger stimulates the pancreatic enzyme secretion. So this is a very powerful thing to be able to do. All right, and then the last detoxification process is to, uh, we have more advanced detoxification uh, processes where we use like a specific uh, formula that's made up of 36 herbs. It targets all the organs in the body, et cetera. That has to be done under clinical guidance. So if you're really, really toxic and struggling, then contact us. We'll be able to show you how to do that. Even though it's done at home, it needs some guidance on how to do that. And the, the last process then is uh, if you've engaged all of this uh, and you feel that you're very toxic, that booklet we're going to send out will give you a kind of a guideline as to how toxic you are. If you have a kind of a moderate toxicity, then you need to do a bowel purge. So that will require uh, something like Epsom salts or castor oil to flush out the, the bulk of the toxin. I'll send those instructions to Rayton. You can send it out to whoever needs that. Uh, but that's a good way at a regular interval of maybe um, every six weeks or eight weeks to do that kind of flush. It really does make a very big difference to rebalancing your metabolism. All right. <clears throat> If you are on chronic medication, it's then important that you stay on those uh, until 
um, we can assess like what needs to be changed. For example, if you start that vegetable broth, your blood sugar is going to drop. And uh, if you've changed the diet to a low carb, healthy fat eating, the blood sugar is going to drop. So we need to then lower the doses or maybe even stop the doses of your diabetic medication. So that requires a bit of assistance and we'll guide you on that. All right, let's go to now, um, just gonna see if I can. <laughs> okay, is that visible? Okay, we're just going to take a quick look at uh, diabetes because so many people have it. And this is a good example of a metabolic dysfunction. So here's our six stages of the disease process. And type 2 diabetes, this is an example of uh, metabolic dysfunction leading to cardiovascular disease. So the early predictors of diabetes, uh, for example, you overweight, uh, you have a darkening of the skin around the back of your neck. This is called acanthosis nigricans. You have skin tags developing. You have a family history of diabetes. If you have one parent that's diabetic, you have a 26% chance of becoming diabetic. If you have two parents are diabetic, your risk is 42%, right? So worth, especially if you're youngish, worth uh, doing the oral glucose tolerance test every so often to see if you're not drifting into this pre-diabetic state. Underlying this is the condition called insulin resistance. So this is a genetic uh, condition that you're carrying, especially from your family lineage. And uh, this basically requires that you monitor this because if you have insulin resistance, one of the first things that's gonna happen is that you won't be able to digest glucose very efficiently you'll start putting on a lot of weight. Uh, for females, they develop uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome, and largely this presents as a lot of tiredness and lethargy. If we do the glucose tolerance test, the insulin resistance will show up as impaired fasting glucose. This is a bit more of an advanced worsening of your insulin resistance. And then impaired glucose tolerance, uh, the more advanced state. So if we go into those uh, stages of disease. These early predictors will be the stage one, stage two. Stage three is the insulin resistance starting to manifest. Stage four, impaired fasting glucose. Impaired glucose tolerance, we now are able to diagnose the disease stage five, and then full-blown diabetes and its complications. So what is the toxin in this case? It's the glucose right? Accumulating glucose in your body is a serious toxin. And uh, you have to be aware that it's deadly and can lead to a very, very miserable life in terms of how you suffer from uh, the complications of high blood sugar. And I can tell you that most diabetics simply don't know how to manage their disease. Largely not their own fault. They haven't been shown how this is done properly. There's a whole uh, stages of what you have to attend to. Um, so there's a program where we teach you how to manage each stage of the diabetic uh, process. There are also seven facets that you have to look after. Very similar to the, the seven skills of wellness, except it's targeted to the diabetes. Okay, so here's the, uh, basically showing you how those stages of the diabetic condition correspond to the six stages of the disease process going down here. Right, again, shortening your lifespan. As soon as you're diabetic, this curve drops dramatically. And before you blink, you're in the declining health and the worsening health band. And what you don't want to do is to go to progressive disability, this last band. Okay. Right, here are the six 
seven aspects of uh, wellness. Again, for a diabetic, you have to know what to eat and what not to eat. So here we recommend the low carb, healthy fat eating and a very specific guideline. And it's basically saying that once you become diabetic or you're pre-diabetic, you your body is now behaving like a diesel engine. Prior to that, if you were not diabetic, you were a petrol engine. Now, would you dare put petrol into a diesel engine? Of course not, because it'll trash your engine. So diabetics need to understand that if you keep feeding yourself the carbs and the hidden sugars, then um, you are going to inexorably, you'll go towards the complication stages of the disease. So, but I eat brown bread. No, any bread is like putting petrol in a diesel engine. Bread is a no-no for diabetics. Roti is a no-no. Uh, rice and potatoes and pasta and pizzas, puris, all of these things loaded with carbs. So anything that comes from a grain is going to spike your sugar. So that we can teach you how to engage that uh, diabetic eating plan. Very, very important um, to get it right. In fact, 95% of your Diabetic control is the diet. If you control that, you may not even need to use medication or insulin, et cetera, right? Just the diet and the exercise is the other big one. All right, so in diabetes, all of these seven aspects are critical to, to being able to live a, um, a robust kind of life, even though you're diabetic. Right? Many a time when people follow these seven um, aspects, they reverse the diabetes to the point where they don't need medication. This is doable if you put in the discipline. But even if your discipline is not that great, even following like three or four of these things can make a big impact on your diabetic control. So this is worth knowing, knowing about. Okay, so the last thing I just want to share with you um, we mentioned this aspect of joy and uh, because we are in a spiritual organization and Swami has shared uh, the spiritual concepts with us, uh, let's take a little bit of a better, deeper insight into this, uh, into this aspect of joy as the default state of the human. Right, and how it relates to wellness. Right, so the definition of joy and bliss, um, it's the default state of the human. And it's either sometimes seen as an ephemeral state, an enduring trait, or it could be a fleeting feeling, a lasting way of being. Right, these are obviously the polar opposites. So is it an ephemeral state or is it an enduring trait? Is it a fleeting feeling or is it a lasting way of being? And obviously it's these two here that we need to develop. Now, the joy is an abstract experience, but it's visible on the face and in the personality. Joyful people are happy, they smile a lot. And Swami says, get rid of your castor oil face, you know, where the smile curve is upside down, like an upside down U. Um, you know, on the spiritual path, there are too many serious people who think spirituality is serious business and they have no joy. So in your journey, in your spiritual journey, this is the goal you want to attain. How to be, be joyful, how to be joyful most of the time in your day. Right. There's a difference between happiness, joy, and bliss. So happiness is like the early stages. And as Swami says, it's the point between two moments of sadness. As you get better at sustaining happiness, which is through your sadhanas, your namasmarana, etc., then joy begins to emerge from your heart, your spiritual heart. And this is a state of unending happiness or prolonged happiness where you don't have a reason for being joyful. You live in a state of appreciation, of abundance, of constantly being aware that your 
giver of all the grace in your life is Swami, God. And then bliss is the heightened state where you're transcending the influence of the three gunas, right? And to be able to get to this point requires some effort. But, you know, Swami is, is giving us the, uh, the assistance in our sadhana. As we do it, more of this should show up in your day-to-day -day life, the bliss. So it's an, kind of a climbing a ladder to that point. Right, so where, where exactly does the joy originate? So in your brain, there's a part of your brain called the limbic system. This part here is the limbic brain. It's made up of the hypothalamus, the pituitary gland, the amygdala, this is the big one, and the hippocampus. All of these, especially the amygdala, is where we experience fear, but it's also where joy can be generated. Hippocampus is another area where every emotion that you experience gets translated into a neurotransmitter in the hippocampus. So every cell in your body is experiencing that emotion. So let's say you have anger, then there's a chemical, a neurochemical produced in the hippocampus, which floods the, the body. And every cell is experiencing anger, including your toenails, your heart, your liver, your brain, your kidneys, your joints. Uh, it's amazing like how you, you drenched in this sea of neurotransmitters um, coming from the hippocampus. Right, and joy then is a similar. So they've defined a, a neurochemical and it's called anandamide. It's uh, very similar to the cannabinoid um, substances. In fact, they, when they first discovered that there were cannabinoid receptors in the brain, they immediately knew that there was a natural substance formed in the body. They just named it anandamide. And so anandamide has been discovered and identified, and it's produced here in this hippocampus. So when you experience joy or bliss, the hippocampus is pumping out this anandamide and it floods the whole brain and the body, and every cell in your body is throbbing with joy. Right, here's a good book if you want to understand uh, this uh, better, called The Molecules of Emotion. Uh, this biology of belief, uh, sorry, this is this anandamide thing we were talking about. All right, so anandamide then is uh, part of what's called the endocannabinoid system. And these are chemicals that are flooding the brain, but uh, coming from that hippocampal area. Right, and then there's the Book of Joy written by the Dalai Lama and Bishop Desmond Tutu, an amazing read. Uh, I suggest you buy the hardcover one that has the, uh, the research references at the back. There's a paperback one where they've left out those references, but those references are amazing to look at the, the, the research that's been done on joy. Okay, Biology of Belief. Uh, this is another interesting book because it defines how belief either switches on or switches off your, your genes. Right? So uh, this is a concept called uh, epigenetics. And it basically explains how your inner belief system, your inner environment or your outer environment, your nutritional environment, your exercise environment, uh, your mental environment, your emotional environment are all affecting the way your genes switch on or switch off. So literally, if you believe you are sick and you know there are some people who love constantly talking about their illness, of course you're gonna get sick because that belief will create the chemicals of the disease that you're identifying. So don't name your disease. And Swami says you give this, this belief too much of credibility in your, in your life. And your thoughts and your, uh, the power of your mind is stronger than any drug you could ever hope to use. So you need to start paying attention to this, what is my belief? And many a time Swami says, most of us are living with primitive beliefs, old beliefs that no longer stand 
us in good stead. They are self-limiting beliefs. We need to change this. And it's changed through wisdom. So if you read what Swami has given over the years, uh, the Summer Shower series, the Vahini series, then you will have a great understanding of how to change your beliefs. Okay? So you've got to do some work in order to get this benefit of this. The Book of Joy. Right, the eight pillars of joy. Uh, first is perspective. This is in the Book of Joy, by the way. There are many different angles to any situation. Humility. Um, so they describe it as I tried to look humble and modest. Humor, laughter and joking, and joking is much better. Acceptance, the only place where change can begin. Forgiveness, freeing ourselves from the past. Gratitude for many things that we have been given. Compassion, something that we want to become. And generosity, we are filled with joy. So when you are joyful, you will be a very generous kind of person. And all of these are in fact values. They are the values that give you the sense of robustness in your health and your wellness. And there is a substance in the body. When you experience joy, it produces the substance called ojas. You should Google that. It's a kind of a vitality substance. And if you've got high levels of ojas, you'll be in bliss and happy and joyful. Low levels of ojas correspond to high levels of armor. Okay. Right. The obstacles to joy are fear, stress, anxiety, frustration and anger, sadness and grief, despair, loneliness, envy, suffering and adversity, illness and fear of death. All of these Swami have spoken about. All right, so there's the three books that we're recommending, Molecules of Emotion, The Biology of Belief, and The Book of Joy. All right, I think I'm going to stop there. Um, that's quite a load of information that we've shared with you. But uh, let's take some questions now. Thank you, Dr. Kuman. Uh, there are two questions, firstly. The one is, uh, what is the most appropriate uh, time for sleep? Uh, I know you did cover sleep in your discussion as well. And the other question was appropriate amount of water to be taken daily is two hours, uh, sorry, two liters enough. So the sleep, you need a minimum of eight hours of sleep. So it depends on when you fall asleep, when you get up. Uh, anything less than that, you're already sleep deprived. Six hours is not enough and your body will struggle uh, eventually. So ideal time, 9, 9.30 to turn in and try to get up by 4.30, 5 o'clock uh, so that you can get your morning routine of sadhana, meditation and things in. And you build that rhythm. Uh, water, yep, you need like a minimum of six to eight glasses, which is roughly about one and a half, maybe two liters. Some people can drink more, some less, but getting to about eight glasses should be sufficient. If it's very humid, you need to add another uh, two glasses or so of water in the day. Thank you, Dr. Shun. There's a couple more questions. Uh, first, what about fermented food? Is it true that this is good for the body? Yes, certain fermented foods like kefir, which is a type of uh, yogurt, uh, Kombucha is a kind of fermented food. They're good for the gut bacteria. Uh, and those bacteria are making your B12 in the colon. Um, so yeah, some fermented foods are good. You know, yogurt, uh, especially if it's plain yogurt is fine. Okay. Uh, next question. How can you fast without experiencing heartburn? Well, the heartburn is a sign that you are already toxic. And a lot of that may not be acid, but could be bile acid. It means your liver is struggling. Uh, usually, if we introduce that veg broth whilst you're fasting, uh, you'll start to feel a lot of relief happening after that. But it doesn't, the burning doesn't last very long. You know, it's maybe a day or two, and then it eases off as your body progresses with the detox. Uh, next question, what helps with the leaky gut? 
the leaky gut is a, quite a complex thing. You know, you've got to first do the, the detox. So we use a concept called weed, seed, and then feed. So it involves detoxification, bringing out all of that toxin, then um, repopulating the gut with uh, probiotics and then using prebiotics to repair the gut lining. Uh, much of that comes from inflammation in the gut. Usually it's certain foods that are inflammatory and toxic foods that damage the junction between the cells, which gives the name leaky gut. Uh, we'll, we'll take about two or three more questions. There are quite a few questions coming through the chat box, but I will share with you and then we can get your responses after this. Um, is it healthy to do colon hydrotherapy? If so, how often should it be done? Okay, colonic hydrotherapy is not a good idea, uh, mainly because you flush out a lot of your critical uh, minerals, things like sodium, uh, calcium, etc. So many a time patients who've done this, they ended up in a sodium deficiency state, which is quite lethal. You can die from it. Uh, you can also drop your potassium levels very low and it can create an erratic heart rate. So um, the better way is um, there are other types of colonics which are called retention enemas. That's a different mechanism to, call, to hydrotherapy. Now, although hydrotherapy has been used in different parts of the world, um, we now know that it's not as safe as uh, it was once thought of, mainly because of these, these electrolyte imbalances. Thank you. Um, next question, Soya. There, there's a lot of um, demand now for vegan type foods, especially with, with soya itself. Is soya now taking into consideration that it's more vegan based now than before? Is it, is it healthier? Yeah, definitely, you know, as an option to say meat-based products, uh, very much so. Uh, even though it's processed to some extent, uh, it's not as toxic as, say, your animal proteins. So the answer is yes, it can be used. But in terms of the quantity, if someone is consuming maybe three or four times of soy products during the week, is that unhealthy? Yeah, any anything that is used too, um, too frequently uh, it'll tend to become a toxin. Even like if milk is a healthy substance, if you have too much of milk, it becomes toxic. Um, same with water. If you drink too much of water, it'll become toxic. Uh, and with any food for that matter. As soon as you start to uh, have too much of anything, it will become. So moderation in, in everything. There isn't a defined figure. You know, some people need to have it more often, some people less. Uh, and mushrooms. Yeah, so mush healthy? mushrooms tend to be classified as a tamasic uh, vegetable. Uh, it doesn't have any pranic energy in it. It's sort of like you're eating the carcass of the fungus. Um, yeah, fr from a spiritual point of view, that it, it is a bit of a limiting uh, food because it doesn't give you prana. But if you wanted something that replaces uh, meat or that kind of uh, texture, then it, it would be acceptable, except that to know that it is a tomasic food. That was yeah. the intellect. So we have about 14 to 15 different questions that what you have posted on the chat group. Are you okay with time or do you just want to- Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm good with time. I can go right up to about 8.30 yeah. if you want. Okay, great. Uh, then let's take a few more. Uh, please advise how to do cleansing of kidney, liver, lung, and colon. Yeah, I'm going to send that ebook out, and it gives an insight into how the process works. Uh, and then, if like you know, if you have more moderate to severe toxicity, then I suggest you come and see us so that we can work out a protocol for you. Uh, Home-based detoxification is doable if you have uh, mild to moderate toxicity. So it's it's quite an elaborate, you know, we have to, each person, we have to design the protocol around what other conditions you have. 
because detoxing is is an energy demanding process. So, um, you know, it's not like one size fits all. Doses have to change, frequency has to change, and so on. Sure. Uh, next question. Uh, what are the remedies if you have been experiencing post-COVID-19 headaches? Right, so that will require uh, certain uh, critical nutrients. So there's one uh, that is called melatonin, which is a neuronutrient. Um, it contains the 13 critical nutrients needed for the brain. And then a second substance called CoQ10, which is a, an enzyme those two will help the headaches and the brain fatigue. I'll send you a link, or maybe I can put it on this chat. I'm not sure how to do that. Uh, if you also message it to me, then I can share it as well. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay. Oh, I've lost the link, yeah. Okay, um, I'll send it to you. No problem. Then the next question, how do you get essential fats if you are a vegetarian? The essential fatty acids are all derived from different types of grain, like soy, soy grain, uh, rice grain, and wheat grain. So this is the oil component of the, uh, of the grain. And uh, the product name is called Trey NN. It'll be on that link I'm going to send. Um, okay. And have a look at it and uh, sauce it out. Good. Uh, the best way to overcome fatigue is the detoxing. That's the first one. Okay. Uh, the training is another very important one. And then to eat lighter meals. Okay. Uh, the next question What are the early signs of diabetes and what tests and checks can be done? Uh, to comment that. So the first thing that you should do is, is if you suspect that you may be diabetic. So how will you know that? One, you are slightly heavier than you should be in terms of weight. Two, you've got that darkening pigment around your neck, skin right. tag, family history of diabetes, either one or both parents. And then if you measure your abdomen uh, around the belly button level, for males, it should be 90 and below. Females, 85 and below centimeters. So if any of those are missed, then it warrants checking your glucose tolerance. So you do a glucose tolerance test. It's an oral test, blood test. Uh, you need to go to the lab. So there's a request form that is provided by your GP. And you do that fasting overnight. So nothing to eat from 8.30 at night. Um, and then you, once you go in, they'll take the first sample of blood Then they make you drink 75 grams of glucose in water and you wait there for two hours and then they do the two hour level. And those levels will tell us whether you're pre-diabetic, diabetic, etc. cetera. Okay, thank you. Uh, B12, is it important, especially for a, a, a vegetarian to have? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, mainly because B12 is made in your colon by bacteria. So one way to assist that is like once a week, take a tablespoon or two tablespoons of cottage cheese. That usually is enough to kickstart the, your, your innate production of, uh, of the uh, B12. Otherwise, the B12 injections are really of not much value. Um, the reason being is that once that injection is given, uh, you'll feel good for maybe an hour or two, but the kidney breaks this thing down and it's in your urine by about two to three hours. Uh, what is available, however, is called sustained release vitamin B because it's made by that same organic company. And that gives you prolonged levels of all the B vitamins uh, over one tablet gives you like 12 hours uh, worth of the the B, B complex. Uh, next question, how do we manage bloating and continuous burping after meals? Sorry, and continuous? 
uh, how do we manage bloating and continuous burping after meals? Yeah, so the easiest way is to just sip uh, the hot ginger tea. One eighth of a teaspoon of ginger powder in a mug of hot water and sip it after a meal and that will deal with the bloating and the burping. Right, that's a sure sign that your digestive enzymes are very weak. Um, so instead of uh, ginger powder, would, would you be able to cut a piece of ginger and put it in? Would, would that also no, no, it has to be the ginger powder. Uh, okay. Raw root ginger, if you put that into boiling water, it'll cause you to sweat. Use that if you have the flu. But the powder is the stimulant to your pancreatic enzymes. Okay. How can one overcome sleep de deprivation? Well, the, the only way you can do that is obviously uh, you've got to catch up that sleep and that timing is important. It's between one and three o'clock in the afternoon, you have to do a 90 minute uh, nap. So, you know, most people can't sleep in the, in the day, but uh, if you can, that's the best way. Take a 90 sure. minute nap once a day between one and three o'clock. Okay. Uh, healthy or good carbs to consume? Um, mainly, it'll be uh, drawn from your complex carbs, things like millet, uh, small amounts of pumpkin, small amounts of butternut, um, sweet potato, maybe a small amount. But you can't eat these in big quantities because they will spike your blood sugar. Okay. If one is diabetic, is eating four to five small portions of food in a day advisable? Well, that depends if you're taking insulin, but uh, generally not a good idea. Um, the way to reverse that effect that's happening in the diabetes is to, in fact, eat um, less often. But again, you know, that, that question can only be answered if we know if this person is insulin dependent or not. Sure. If you're not insulin dependent, then you don't need that many meals in a day. Okay. Is it okay to take Neurobian to supplement the B12? Yeah, Neurobian uh, is a, a kind of a complex of the B vitamins. But again, the same thing. It's firstly chemical in its uh, nature doesn't absorb as effectively as organic nutrients. And uh, so it has limited value, but you know the way doctors prescribe it is that's how you're going to get it. Um, so you know if you really want to get quality health, you've got to invest in your the right type of uh, supplemental nutrients. So the sustained release vitamin B co is the one that would give you the best kind of uh, quality for your money. Okay. And we'll just take one more question. Uh, re remedy for a chronic cough. Dry cough, wet cough? Um, I would say dry cough. So the easiest way is to massage the chest, the front and the back with warm uh, black sesame oil, right? Black sesame oil, not black seed oil, black sesame oil. You can do that twice a day and usually within about three days or so that dry cough subsides. Thank you, Dr. Uh, thank you for your time. I think there, there are more questions, um, but I would say that I would, I will send you those those questions and then you can just respond on email and I can yeah. share with those specific devotees just okay. due to time. So okay. uh, thank you Dr. Kuban for your for your time and uh, for your support in this uh, presentation. I think everyone did benefit from it. Um, there is a recording of it so we will share it with our devotees as well. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thanks everybody from Saira.
Oh, oh, oh.